Who's excited to be here? Yes, give him praise. That was amazing. Uh, I was getting a little emotional in the back trying to pull it together, but praise God for the radical transformation that he makes in all of our lives. So a special welcome to everybody in the room. Uh, My name's Sam Spence. I'm on the teaching team here, and I also serve as a financial trustee. If you're joining us online, special welcome to you as well. So I am massively pumped. I don't know if that's an expression, but I am massively excited to be sharing uh, in a new series through the book of Haggai, or Haggai. You can say it either way. So let's get started with a big woo from this group over here. And let's get a yeah from over here. Yeah! Oh, Todd scared me. <laughs> all right, so everybody's ready. We're all coffeeed up. So we're starting a two-week short series through the Old Testament book of Haggai. Um, so Haggai was a minor prophet. Poor guy never made it to the majors. Okay, you guys got my joke. Huge baseball fan. Okay? So if you want to turn there in your Bibles, um, go ahead and grab Haggai. Um, some of you guys are sweating right now, going... Where's Haggai at? I'll give you a hint. Um, It's after Zephaniah and before Zechariah. Okay? So while you're getting there, I'm going to ask you all a question. Have you ever been in a place or a moment in your life where you're reflecting where you are currently? This includes what you're doing, where you're working. And you're in this moment, you begin to look around, and you're like, man, I thought I would have this figured out by now. Or I thought I would have been here by now. Anybody had one of those moments before? Okay, a few of us. Okay. So sometimes we look around, we have this unsettling, the sinking feeling, and you think to yourself, man, by this point, by age 30, I I just expected more. By the time I reached this age, I reached this salary, I had this car, or or I was married, um, like we heard this testimony earlier, I thought that there would be something more, but we're often left with this void. And I remember for myself, I was in college, um, the most recent one I remember, I I experienced this. I was 22 at the time, okay, and as 22-year-olds often are, you're very enthusiastic and naive, okay, I'll be honest, I've been there. So I had an idea of what future Sam was going to look like, and specifically future Sam in his 30s, okay? I thought future Sam in his 30s would, number one, have everything figured out, right? Have we had that before? Okay, and fast forward, I'm 31 now, and I don't have everything figured out. Okay, I saw future Sam as like super successful Mr. Business who, who no, made no mistakes. But, but to fast forward now, I'm learning that it sometimes feels I'm still faking my way through life sometimes. I still don't do my taxes. I pay somebody to do that. It still feels like I don't have it figured out. I still struggle to eat nutritional foods because I love pizza and chips right? So here's what I'm getting at. Every once in a while, we look at our lives, we tell ourselves, I never thought I would be here, or I thought I would be further along. So why are we talking about this? I'm going to tell you, because this is honestly the mood of what's going on uh, during the time when Haggai was written. The people in the story we're going to read today, they're looking around going, how did we end up here? Where did we go wrong? I thought we would be in much better shape than we are right now. So to give you a little backstory um, about the text we're reading today, we're going to go back to the, the reign of King Solomon. Okay, Specifically, it was the fourth year of King Solomon's reign, and one of the most magnificent temples like for God ever. Okay, This was beautiful. This was a a world wonder at the time. This was the Taj Mahal. People would travel just to see this temple, to worship their God. It was amazing. But after King Solomon died, the people's hearts turned away from God. They got distracted, like we as humans often do. Uh, They started putting their houses in front of God's houses. They started worshiping idols, placing things between them and God. So essentially, God allowed a series of events to take place in order to pull the people's hearts back to himself. So in 587 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar and his army, they they crushed the southern kingdom of Judah. And this destroyed this amazing temple that Solomon had built in his kingdom. They destroyed the whole city. They grabbed all the people. They put them in in captivity. But to add insult to injury, this temple, 
this house where God dwelt was destroyed. And in doing so, it stripped away the spiritual identity of the people. They were crushed. They were devastated. And then on top of that, the Jews were taken into captivity for decades, and we see in the scriptures specifically 50 years. So your home gets taken away, your spiritual identity is crushed, and then you're imprisoned technically for 70 years because they were already in captivity for 20 before the destruction of the temple. So things aren't looking good. And now when we read captivity for 50 years, uh, for me at least, this doesn't quite register in my mind. Okay, I'm 31 years old, so by all technicality, I would have not known what it was like to live free, right? 50 years. So let's put this in a modern context, and we'll have some fun, okay? So imagine this. Some enemy nation develops massive nuclear power, and they say, we're going to take, take out the five major U.S. cities um, of your ally countries unless your government surrenders, we're going to take over the USA's biggest cities. You've got L.A., Houston, Chicago, and Worcester, right? The five <laughs> biggest cities. That was a joke, making sure you're paying attention. So playing along with this story to, to give us an idea of what's going on. So the president, the council, the leaders, the government, they think, well, we can't retaliate because this will start a, a global nuclear war. So the only thing we can do is surrender or we'll all die. So the government leaders step down and suddenly... We're no longer citizens of our own nation. We're captive. We can't go anywhere we want. We can't worship who we want. And as a nation, we become in bondage for 50 years. Doesn't that sound horrible? That's like my, that, that would keep me up at night. But then after this, okay? But then imagine the joy after 50 years of slavery, about 50,000 people are allowed to travel back to Jerusalem. They're allowed to go back to the capital of Judah to rebuild. Finally, after decades, generations, they get to go back to their home. Doesn't that sound like a party? It's like, woo! Some of these people have never even experienced it. They're like, freedom! Let's rebuild this temple. So the Jewish people, they went back, and the first thing they started to do was to rebuild this temple, to regain that spiritual identity, to rebuild God's house. They built the foundation, they built the altar, they were on a roll, they were like, rock on, get her done, you know, whatever. But then all of a sudden, work stopped. It got difficult for them. And they began to say amongst themselves, this must not be the time to rebuild the temple because it just got hard. So that's kind of the backstory of the context we're talking about today. So for 14 years, okay, 50 years in slavery, and then for 14 years, they put off the temple project. They started to, we'll see in scripture, build their own houses. They put their kingdom ahead of God's kingdom. So they built their own houses. We see in scripture paneled houses, very nice. So let's go ahead and jump into the text here in Haggai 1, verses 1 and 2. And I practice these names, but I'm going to butcher them. So we'll butcher them together. So let's read this. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of, yeah, I should have practiced these more, Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. So we see here the Lord is raising up a prophet Haggai, and God speaks through Haggai and says something comical if you think about it. He says in verse 2, this is what the Lord says, these people say. Now, I find this comical because almost everywhere else in Scripture and in the Old Testament, when God talks about his people, they, he calls them his people, my people. But what, I, what we're seeing here, this is Sam's opinion, I think we see a little bit of frustration <laughs> because these people I kind of see what's going on here, and I'm, I'm going to tell you why. Um, and Sean, you can put up a picture on the screen of my dogs, okay? I think God is doing here what I do to my wife when, I, when our dogs do something wrong, okay? So we've got two dogs. We've got Slider on the right. He looks adorable, but he's annoying. Um, <laughs> he's got a little shrill bark, and you can feel your head pulse every time he barks. And then Jakey, or, or Jake's on the left. Um, he's our se shelter dog with separation anxiety, and he pees on everything. Um, so, our house is chaotic sometimes, 
right? And those of you that have been to our house, it is chaotic when you walk in. It is loud, your head hurts, you get a headache. Um, they're annoying. So the corgi on the right, they don't tell you when you get a corgi, they bark all the time. Okay, they're adorable, but they bark all the time. So when Chelsea gets home from work, it's work, 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 work. And then you leave the house, and then Jake pees, and you come in, you got to clean it up. So where am I getting with this? Okay, we're talking about this. Okay, so whenever these annoying moments happen, when Chelsea gets home from work, I'm like, you're not going to believe what your dogs have been doing all day. <laughs> this ain't my dog. My dogs are well-behaved. They're super annoying. I didn't want these dogs. They're dumb, but I do love them. I do love them. <laughs> and the funny part is I've been to friends' houses and seen this too with humans, not dogs. Do you guys know houses like that? Yeah. It's like, honey, come get your child. <laughs> Mm-mm, that's not my boy. I raised him better, right? <laughs> so this is Sam's opinion. Okay, this, is, this could be what's going on. God's like, these people... They're not my people. They're annoying me. They're driving me crazy. They're being disobedient. They're being dumb. These people are driving me crazy. And scripture goes on to say, um, being these people, he's, they say the time is not now. Okay, I think that was on the previous slide. So I'm pretty sure, certain that the people during this time thought that the time wasn't now because they were receiving opposition. We see that the Samaritans were opposing their work. It was going so good, and then it was going so bad. Things got difficult. In church, I've met so many people, and myself included, that when we receive opposition, we can convince ourselves that it must not be God's will. Because if it was God's will, it would be easy. We're guilty of saying things like, man, it was going so well, and then it got hard, it got difficult. This can't be what God wants for me. It's too hard. But God wants us to understand that the closer we get to doing something that matters in the heart of God, the more likely we're going to face this opposition. And it's almost guaranteed. It's kind of like a cause and effect. So if you've got your, your notes with you, um, this is your first main point. Well, I think that's your second main point. So you can write that down. So let's see if the next one. There you go. That's your first main point. So receiving opposition isn't a sign that God is against you. Receiving opposition isn't a sign that God is against you. A lot of times it's a sign that you're doing what God wants you to do. I've heard it said this way, I don't really worry when people are opposing me. I worry when no one is. Right? Because then I'm not doing much for the glory of God. The moment you start to move forward and do something, move into obedience to what God called you to do, mark it down, there's going to be spiritual oppression on the way. When you find yourself being obedient to God, it gets difficult. It gets challenging. And I want to encourage you with this one simple thought. And when things are hard, they're challenging, they're difficult. So this is our second main point. Choose the hard, obedient decision over the easy, comfortable decision. Over and over again, just tell yourself, God, with your help, enable me, empower me to choose the hard, obedient decision over the easy, comfortable decision. Because, church, it would be so easy to quit focusing on God and start focusing on our own comfort. That's easy. So we see in Scripture, these people, okay, they needed to choose the hard, obedient decision over the easy, comfortable decision and continue to build this temple, and for us, here's some more application. It would be so easy for us to hold a grudge. It would be so comfortable. But choosing that hard, obedient decision and begin to forgive them, that's what we're talking about. We need to live in such a way to just be good stewards of, of, of everything we have. So, um, moving on. So, As we transition here, I'm going to do things a little abstract this morning. So we're actually going to throw a challenge time in the middle of the sermon. Okay, I've never done it before. I've never experienced it, but we'll see how it works. You guys down? Yeah. Okay, cool. We'll try it. We'll experiment. So I want all of us okay, to think for just a moment and ask yourself, 
is there some unfinished assignment in your life? So think about that. And while you're thinking about that, I want you to experience the rest of our time together through, I guess, what you would call a lens of that unfinished assignment. So you can think back. Maybe it was this past week you felt God tell you something. Maybe it was last month. Maybe it was yesterday. Maybe it was a month ago. Maybe it was 14 years ago. Can you remember a moment where you believe God put something on your heart or told you, okay, that you have not walked into? Okay, so I want you to reflect, and if you want to write it down, please do. So maybe in this moment you felt you were supposed to reach out to a person or be generous with a person or be a good steward of something with them. Maybe you felt like you were supposed to serve somewhere or start a a mission somewhere or travel somewhere. Maybe you felt called to give a big gift to a person or, or, or somebody. So was there something in your life you felt you were supposed to do but never did? So think about that. And it's my prayer that the rest of this morning that God will speak to you and reveal himself to you. So please, all of us, as we, we proceed here this morning with this lens of what might be that unfinished assignment. So let's continue in verse three through five. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. It is time, is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains in ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says, give careful thought to your ways. So this is what God said. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai and God asked, is it time for you yourself to be living in your paneled houses while God's house is in ruins. Now, we're going to see this phrase over and over again, okay? The give careful thoughts to your ways. Give careful thought. That means think about how you're living. What are you putting where God should be? He says, my house is left in ruins, but you got the paneled houses, the big screen TVs, the swimming pools, That's what a paneled house is that they're talking about, elaborate houses. At this point in history, we're seeing that the people are putting their own comfort above God's house, God's priority. So God says, give careful thought to your ways. Give careful thought to your ways. So here's a challenge. Are you trying to make a name of yourself, like these people here, of your kingdom, lowercase kingdom, instead of God? Where are your priorities? Are you putting your house above his house, or are you consumed with your own agenda instead of being consumed with God's agenda? Is there something that you're putting where God should be? Because it says, give careful thought to your ways. Be careful how you're living, because God wants us to choose the hard, obedient decision over the easy, comfortable decision. So, Maybe there's some of us here today that might be wrestling with this. Maybe you're at a crossroads in in life. Maybe there's something in your life that you know you're supposed to do it. God's called you to do it, but you feel like taking the easy, comfortable decision. But God says, hey, take the right, obedient decision. So let's, let's read another verse that is super, super great. Okay, this is Haggai 1, uh, chapter 6. It says, You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them into a purse with holes in it. Does that strike you like it does me? My word, we live in a culture that says more, 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 and more. But look at what we're seeing in Haggai 6. We have a culture that is more, 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 more. Big paneled houses, everything they want. Let me give you the modern translation of this. This is Sam's modern translation. You're working your tail off. You still feel like you don't have anything. You're pouring your life into a career. You can make more and more money, but you still feel empty and hollow. You have more than you ever wanted or ever you, you ever need. You're still not satisfied. You entertain yourself constantly. You go to sports games, you're on TikTok, you're on Instagram, you go to movies, you eat out, yet there's still a longing for something more. Dr. Phil might look at you and say, how's that going for you? (laughs) Right? That show's hilarious. 
That's a whole side sermon. So we're seeing give careful thought to your ways. Because, church, God doesn't like things in his place. Think about it. Are you putting your house ahead of God's house? What does that look like for you? Well, church, it's where are you spending your money? Where are you spending your time? Are you disciplined? Church, what about your schedule? It says give careful thoughts to your ways. Are you putting your agenda, your schedule before God's? Does your personal schedule, this is pretty brutal, but I'm just going to be honest. (laughs) Does your personal schedule determine whether you go to church or not? Does your personal schedule dictate your involvement in church? If it does, we need to give careful thought to our ways. Our personal agenda should come after God's agenda. And, And the older I get, the more I see children set the schedule for their family. Okay. I'm not going to single anybody out. You've heard, last time I was up here, I talked about sports. Okay. I'm not going to hit that again. But church, what I'm saying is when parents bend to whatever activity their kids are involved in and everything becomes centered around the kids, what are we doing? We're putting our house above God's house. You as a parent, the spiritual leader of your family, you're going to be held accountable for how you lead your family. Give careful thought to your ways. You are called to lead your children. Don't let your children lead you. Okay? That's all I'm saying. So, verses 7 and 8. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Hey, here it is again, church. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountain and bring down the timber. Build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. Oops, you weren't supposed to see that. (laughs) We'll get back to that. So verses 7 through 8, there's some great application here too. Because God's so loving, so good. They're like, oh, we got to build this temple. We don't feel good enough to do it. It's not going well. There's opposition. This is difficult. The Samaritans are making this hard. But look how loving God is. He gives them a one, two, three step plan, right? Look at verse 8. Okay, he says, go up into the mountains. Okay. That's step one, okay? Such great instructions, right? Then what's step two? Bring down the timber. Great, right? And step three, build my house. Step by step by step. Here's one, two, three. I love that. That's simple, right? God is speaking And it's simple. Here are steps one, two, and three. But church, here's the problem. So many of us will go, God's, what about steps four, five, and six? God has told you steps one, two, and three. So many of us say, I need the details. Who's going to pay for it? When are we going to eat lunch? (laughs) I'm one of those people who say, when are we going to eat lunch? (laughs) Who's going to be there? Because if he's there, I don't want to be there. Do I get a tax write-off on this? You know? How much time is it going to take? I'm, I'm sore, you know? I've, I've been working a lot. How's this going to work out? Is the weather going to cooperate? If it's hot, can we wait till it gets cloudy, God? Is it going to be easy? Do I get my name on the temple because I helped? Right? Because if I don't get my name on it, I'm not going to help. <laughs> but God makes this so simple. And when God calls us, it, it's this simple. He says, don't worry about steps four, five, and six. Just do one, two, and three. So here's another fill, and you guys have already seen this. Sometimes you have to be obedient before God shows you more. Okay? Not always, sometimes. Sometimes we say, I want the details. And you know what God says? You can't handle the details. (laughs) Right? What's that movie? You want the truth, you can't handle the truth? Oh, yeah. That's an, old, that's an old movie now. Jeez, we're all getting old. He says, you can't handle all of it. God's got it. God says, I'll give you what you need when you get there, but first, you need to take the first step. What do you do, church? Go up the mountain, right? Bring down the timber, start building my house. It's that simple. But what is that for you? What has God told you? 
Remember I gave us this application earlier to be thinking about a calling that you may have experienced or received? Are you overcomplicating it, is what I'm asking. Because maybe God has given you steps one and two. Maybe we want steps four, five, and six. God says, I'll give you what you need when you get there, but first, you need to take the first step. And I don't know what it is for you. Maybe you need to get in better physical shape, and you don't know where to start. Let me tell you, start. (laughs) Start exercising, right? Take step one. Get eight hours of sleep. Eat better. Maybe you want to get out of debt, but you don't know where to start. Get help, right? You get what I'm saying, Spend less than you earn. Or maybe for you, your, your marriage isn't in a good spot and you don't know what to do about it. You're like, God, what do I do? I don't know what to do. Step one, humble yourself. Apologize. You see, this is what it means to walk by the Spirit. That's what we're commanded to do as followers of Jesus. Sometimes we want to walk side by side with Jesus. Right? That's our sinful nature. We want to know the whole picture when reality, we can only handle steps one, two, and three. Steps one, two, and three. We want to know the details. We want God to show us everything. But church, God's not going to show you steps four, five, and six until you take one, two, and three. So let's talk about this unfinished assignment, okay? I want you to think about that assignment or that calling again. A time where you heard God speak personally to you And this is something that you have not acted on. This is something you haven't pursued. And this is an area you haven't been obedient in this calling. And church, God makes it so simple for us. So maybe you're asking the question, what should I do when I feel God calling me? If you're taking notes, very simply to get started is to quit talking and start doing. To quit thinking, to start doing. Don't think about it. Quit talking about it. Go up the mountain, bring down the wood, build the temple. It's simple. Do something today. Do the next thing that God has shown you and just do it. Because we're not going to know steps three, three, four, five until we do steps one and two. Be faithful to God today. Be obedient to God. Go up the mountain, bring down the wood, build my temple. And church, don't miss these opportunities. Because just in my story, in my small moments of obedience, it's humbling the blessings that come with obedience, okay? You can't even explain it. And there's those in the room that have experienced that as well. So another thing I want to leave us with, okay, is our next fill-in. So many times we're worried about the outcome of a situation, okay? Obedience is our responsibility. Outcome is, ju- is God's responsibility. Our responsibility is to just do what God called you to do. He's going to do the rest. We don't need to worry about it. What we need to worry about is the obedience part because obedience is our responsibility. It's that simple. So for you, maybe you've got a sin that's been plaguing you and you've been keeping it a secret. Church, let me say it's easy to keep stuff a secret. It's hard to confess. Obedience. And God will determine the outcome. Don't worry about what other people think. Obedience is your job. Maybe for you, your calling in the past is God has been pointing you to serve at an area in the church. But you're worried about the outcome. Obedience is your job. Sign up. Don't leave today without signing up. Maybe some of you know you need a Christian community. You need a church home but you're worried about the outcome. You get what I'm saying? Obedience is our responsibility. We need to choose the hard, obedient decision over the easy, comfortable decision. So is there some unfinished assignment? So I want to move into a moment of prayer. We can dim the lights down. Um, so, So church... Let's pray together and move into a moment of prayer. Father, thank you that you're present with us. God, thank you for a living word. 
We thank you for an active word. We thank you for a story that happened 500 years before the birth of Christ is true today as it was true then. God, we thank you for your presence, God. God, we thank you that you want to minister us. Thank you for calling to us, God. God, thank you for this church, a church that wants to be different, a church that wants to learn, Father. I want to continue in this moment of prayer with heads down, eyes closed as we reflect today. I'm going to ask again, is there an unfinished assignment in your life? Is there something you're feeling called to do someone you're supposed to reach out to, whatever it is, something you're supposed to give, something you're supposed to start, something you're supposed to write. Maybe it's an appreciation you're supposed to give, an apology you're supposed to send out. What is unfinished in your life this morning? What is it for you? What's steps one and two? Because we learned, go up the mountain, cut down the timber, build my house. So let's continue in prayer. God, I thank you so much for this church body. A church body hungry to hear from your word. God, a, a church that's sensitive to the voice of your spirit. And I pray, God, for the faith, the faith that they would act taking, in this, fir- taking this first step, God. Whatever their first step is, God, I I pray that they will trust you. I pray that they will be obedient. Father, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So.